Tonight, breaking news. Colorado's Supreme Court has disqualified former President Donald Trump from the 2024 ballot. The court ruling that Trump, who is the current GOP frontrunner for president, cannot appear on the state's ballots for the 2024 election, accusing him of inciting the January 6th riot at the Capitol. What this means for voters in that state. Also breaking tonight, the record surge at the southern border. Border Patrol says more than 12,000 migrants were apprehended just on Monday, the most ever in a single day. Now, a new Texas bill will allow police to arrest migrants who cross illegally into the country and send them to jail. Those record numbers also felt in cities like New York and Chicago. A five-year-old boy dying in Chicago after falling ill in a packed shelter. City officials urging the Biden administration to step in and help. We have team coverage at the border and outside of the White House. The flooding emergency along the East Coast, heavy rains swelling rivers and washing out roads. An NBC News crew right there with rescuers as a 14-year-old girl and her sister were pulled from their New Jersey home. Hundreds of thousands still without power. In Massachusetts, officials warning it could take days before power returns as freezing temperatures move in. Fire and fury after weeks of warnings a volcano in Iceland erupting, sending lava towards nearby towns. Tourist spots now closed ahead of a busy travel week. Plus, back here at home, the Senate staffer out of a job accused of having sex on video inside a Senate hearing room. How he responded to the allegations on LinkedIn as the senator he worked for breaks his silence. And the plane taking off, but not on purpose. Strong wind gusts causing a plane to start to roll on the tarmac and crashing into stairs. The major travel headache this caused. Top Story starts right now. Good evening, I'm Ellison Barber, in for Tom Yamas. Let's get right to that breaking news. The Colorado Supreme Court ruling former President Trump cannot appear on the state's ballot for the 2024 elections, overturning a lower court ruling and saying, quote, a majority of the court holds that President Trump is disqualified from holding the office of the president under Section 3 of the 14th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. That provision, Section 3, it says that no person can serve as an officer of the United States, who, having previously taken an oath of federal office, engaged in insurrection or rebellion against the United States. So in September, a group of six Colorado voters, they actually sued to block Trump from state ballots in 2024 under that provision. At the time, that lawsuit, they were accusing him of inciting the January 6th Capitol riot. The former president, though, is really leading in the polls. A recent New York Times Siena College poll showing 46 percent of registered voters said they would vote for Trump, Biden trailing by two percentage points in that poll. So the former president posting and responding to this news out of Colorado very quickly on his True Social account, writing in part, quote, they don't want to run against me and never have. I am leading in the polls by a lot. And based on the results of the failed Biden administration, this will continue. But justice weaponize is a very dirty game to play, and it can have repercussions. So let's get right to all of this with NBC's Garrett Haig, who covers the Trump campaign. Garrett, just break this down a little more for us. Talk to how talk about how we got to this point, right? Was this a ruling people were expecting to happen? And what do we know? Just at this hour. This is a surprising ruling, Ellison. We have seen cases like this brought in other states, and they've mostly been dismissed on one of two legal points. Either courts have found that there's no proof or it's not fully determined that Donald Trump engaged in rebellion or insurrection, or that he's not technically an officer of the United States. Some courts make the distinction whether an officer of the United States would include the president or is basically everybody else who works in the federal government who's not the president. So a lot, there's been a lot of these lawsuits in other states. This is the first one to get this far. The ruling itself is stunning, but its impact, I think, um, in two ways is unknown. First, into what's actually going to happen on the Colorado ballot. The judges in this case stay their own ruling until January 4th. Colorado is supposed to print their ballots January 5th. There's some time in there for this to be adjudicated, perhaps by the U.S. Supreme Court, as Trump's campaign has indicated. That's where he wants to go. The Colorado primary is until Super Tuesday on March 5th. So, so there's some time for the legal part of this to work out.
But the political repercussions are happening in real time right now, and I think they're really interesting because what you're starting to see already are Republicans, mostly Trump supporting Republicans already, but I suspect you're going to see a bit of, you know, kind of what color jersey you're wearing dictates your reaction here, rushing to Trump's defense on this, arguing that this is more election interference. Some of these elected Republicans are arguing that this is proof that Democrats just don't want to face Trump and that they'll do anything they can to keep him off the ballot. I'll be very curious to see how Trump's two biggest primary competitors, Ron DeSantis and Nikki Haley, react to this, because if passes any prologue, I think the best parallel here might be the New York hush money case, where conservatives thought that case was weak, and they were forced to basically defend Donald Trump against what was perceived to be liberal prosecutors. In that case, here would be liberal judges, um, at a time where we're four weeks out from the Iowa caucus. They'd like to be attacking him, but they may feel like they have to defend him from something that they see as overreach. So that's the legal and the political repercussions we're watching for. But Trump is about to take the stage in Iowa. And Ellison, uh, you know as well as anybody, I bet he's going to have quite a bit to say about this. Yeah, I imagine. And Garrett, just to drill down a little more on what you were laying out so well in terms of the political versus legal ramifications here. I mean, when you're talking about the politics of this and other candidates may be feeling like even though they're running against him, they have to step in and say, hey, this is wrong and, and kind of parrot some of the same lines that Donald Trump will, do we think this actually could have a positive effect on Donald Trump and his campaign for 2024. In a Republican primary, mm -hmm. it absolutely could. I mean, look, the Republican base has totally embraced the idea of a weaponized Justice Department, of a weaponized system that has gone after Donald Trump and goes after conservatives. To many in the Republican base, I think this will look like one more example of that. And so if you're if you're the, Donald Trump's competitors who've tried various arguments against him, you know, electability arguments, arguments that it's time to move on, uh, you know, it's hard to kind of crack into this. Once again, you've got Donald Trump blotting out the sun in terms of news coverage. We're not covering tonight the DeSantis and Haley and Ramaswamy blitz that's happening in Iowa right now. Instead, we're talking about Trump, and we're talking about Trump in a way where they're probably going to have to embrace at least some of the same language. And if Trump makes the argument that he's such a dominant frontrunner that this is basically, you know, Democrats afraid of him and taking him off the ballot. I think that's something that a significant portion of the Republican primary electorate will agree with. And one other point on this, Ellison, Trump's lead nationally is so big that even if he loses his appeals here, if he's fighting this out just in Colorado specifically, and he's not on the Colorado ballot, he could find himself still the nominee without winning on the Colorado primary ballot or even the Colorado general election ballot, a state that Republicans haven't won, I don't think, since George W. Bush. Um, if it's just this state, he can firewall this off, use it as political fuel, and not even feel necessarily the electoral consequences. All right. Garrett Hake in Washington, D.C., expertly guiding us through this breaking news. Thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Let's stick with this ruling for a bit and bring in NBC News legal analyst Angela Sinadella. Angela, let's start broadly with sort of what is at the heart of this ruling. We're talking about Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. And I think most Americans would be forgiven and it would be completely understandable if they are saying, what the heck is that? I have never heard of it, have not read it. But this is a provision that says no person can serve as an officer of the United States if they engaged in insurrection or rebellion against the U.S. And then there's this other caveat that it's after already taking an oath for federal office. Explain to us what is happening here. This ruling, as Garrett pointed out, it wasn't something we were expecting tonight. How big of a deal is this? It's a massive deal. And I mean, the biggest issue here that the court ruled on was whether or not Donald Trump qualified as somebody who engaged in an insurrection. And the Colorado Supreme Court decided that Donald Trump did engage in an insurrection. Now, we know the lower court ruled in Trump's favor and decided that the term office did not apply to president. Now, the Supreme Court here decided that that is not true. They reversed that decision, and they have stayed this until January 4th. Now, that timing, though, Allison, is extremely tricky if we think about it, given the holidays and given the new year. So this is requiring the U.S. Supreme Court to agree to hear this case and then provide a ruling before January 4th. That timing is going to be tricky for anyone, let alone the Supreme Court. Do we think they will be able to step in here and go ahead and hear it in that time frame? Because, I mean, you're right. We're talking about a stay until January 4th. But then, as Garrett was reporting, Colorado starts printing their ballots on January 5th. It's hard to imagine 
one court in Colorado, the Supreme Court, they are dealing with this in time to have it some sort of resolution, at least for printing the ballots. It's also hard to see a world where the Supreme Court can really tackle all of this, but that is what they're there for, right, is to step in when there are a lot of different discrepancies of courts ruling across the state, they come in. I mean, is it just a given that the Supreme Court will pick this up as quickly as they can and just a question of when and can it be quick enough? Yes, I think it's a given that they will pick it up, largely because the U.S. Supreme Court, first of all, likes to be the final arbiter and ruler on the U.S. Constitution, because this was the Colorado Supreme Court here interpreting the U.S. Constitution, Section 14. As you said, nobody has really heard it before, except for constitutional scholars who are wondering whether or not Donald Trump can be president. So I think the Supreme Court is going to hear it. Do I think they're going to agree with the Colorado Supreme Court? I'm going to say absolutely not. And that's because when a law like this really pertains to the Civil War decades, centuries ago, the Supreme Court tends to like to default to the concept of democracy. So in this case, I am going to predict that the U.S. Supreme Court is going to default to having the voters of a state, the voters of a country, mm -hmm. be the people who should decide if Donald Trump will be president, Allison. Hmm. So Angela, I am curious what this might mean for other states, because Colorado is not the only state that has lawsuits along these same lines, right, seeking to block Donald Trump from appearing on the ballot in the 2024 presidential election. Should we expect this ruling from Colorado to impact other rulings nationwide before the Supreme Court even has a chance to weigh in? You know, here's the thing. In a in a general scenario, absolutely. This would give other courts more leverage, more power to feel they can take a step that is so extraordinary as this. But again, given this timeline, the year is winding down. Courts and judges don't want to work that hard at the end of year, as does nobody. So I think it's doubtful that we are going to see a flurry of activity, a flurry of rulings prior to the Supreme Court taking it out. Because I imagine at this point the Supreme Court will likely attempt to do this in the first few days of January, mm -hmm. which in itself would be unprecedented. Yeah. And just while we have you, what happens if they aren't able to get this solved before those ballots are printed in Colorado on January 5th? So it would be likely at that point that Trump would again appeal for another stay and request for the deadline to be continued. And then it will be day by day seeing who is going to win this race against time. Hmm. All right. Angela Sinadella, thank you so much. We always appreciate your insights and analysis. Thank you. Let's get right to that other major headline tonight. Border Patrol officials say more than 12,600 migrants crossed into the U.S. illegally on Monday, the highest single-day number ever recorded, one of the busiest border sectors in Texas, and now the state's governor has signed a bill that will allow police to arrest migrants who enter the U.S. illegally. All of this sets up another potential showdown between the Lone Star State and the White House. NBC News correspondent Morgan Chesky is on the border tonight. Tonight, stunning images from Eagle Pass, Texas, where thousands of migrant men, women, and so many children now fill entire fields. The groups lining the Rio Grande clinging to blankets, huddling to stay warm, all waiting for hours to be processed and most likely to be released into the United States. Of all our trips to Eagle Pass, this is the largest group we have ever encountered. Sources tell us the majority of these families are Venezuelan, and we've just learned from authorities nearly 3,000 were apprehended just yesterday. On Monday alone, a staggering new record. DHS officials telling NBC News more than 12,000 migrants crossed the U.S.-Mexico border, the most recorded in a single day ever. The surge sparking a new battle between the Lone Star State and the White House. Republicans here blaming President Biden's border policies for a record number of illegal crossings. Biden's deliberate inaction has left Texas to fend for itself. Now Governor Greg Abbott signing a new law, making illegal immigration a state crime, empowering police and sheriff's deputies to arrest migrants. Texas has already put controversial floating barriers in the Rio Grande and barbed wire along the border, but both face ongoing challenges. The White House calling the new law extreme. The ACLU of Texas saying they'll sue. That is going to drive our immigrant communities into the shadows. It's going to increase suspicion of, of relying on law enforcement. How much longer can you keep up? No, we can't. We can't. Now it's like three or 4,000 right now. 
So they're coming in. Maverick County Sheriff Tom Schmerber tells us they're struggling to cope with the number of migrants, but the new laws only raise new questions. Namely, where newly arrested migrants would potentially be held. His jail holds 250, and today sits just below 200. I don't have the resources, I won't have the space. Where I want to put them? And Morgan joins us now from Eagle Pass, Texas. Morgan, we can see those crowds, the massive amount of migrants standing just behind you. Officials say they expect more soon. Yeah, Ellison, that's right. The sheriff here tells me that he's been warned by Mexican authorities that even though they've shut down the railroad into Eagle Pass, a large group of migrants has left that train and is now headed for this area on foot. They're anticipated to arrive at some point later this week. Ellison. And Morgan, we also heard you ask the sheriff in your piece about where all of these migrants will potentially be held. Do we have any more information on the plans for tonight? Well, we do know that when this law goes into effect, it's tentatively set for March 2024, so they have a little bit of breathing room, but Ellison, not much. He says as it stands right now, his jail is not equipped to certainly handle an influx of migrants that you see behind me. If these numbers stay the way they are, he said they will most definitely need state or federal help building new facilities or finding new locations to house these men, women, and children coming across the border. Ellison. Ski, Morgan Chesky in Eagle Pass. Thank you. Staying on immigration, Chicagoans are grieving the loss of a five-year-old migrant who died over the weekend after falling ill in a temporary shelter. That city, as well as others across the country, still receiving more migrants by the day as their resources are pushed to the brink. NBC News senior White House correspondent Gabe Gutierrez has more. Tonight, migrant advocates are reeling after the death of five-year-old Jean Carlos Martinez. We're heartbroken for the loss of this baby. After days of being sick, he was found unresponsive in a temporary migrant shelter in Chicago. 2241 South Hall said ambulance force is requesting CPD as soon as possible for a child with cardiac arrest. Martinez was rushed to the hospital but later died. Fire department confirming to NBC Chicago that several other people at the shelter were hospitalized with high fevers, including a one-year-old girl, a four-year-old girl, and an 18-year-old woman. We can see a lot of these kids and are sick. They don't have any coats. They don't have shoes. This mother is staying at that shelter. The truth is the conditions are quite alarming because we also have small children, she says. Of course, we're providing support for the family, and we are obviously deeply sorry um, and hurt um, by this loss. Chicago's mayor does not blame the city or its policies for the child's death. They're showing up sick. Do you hear me? They're showing up sick. He points the finger at southern states who he says are not communicating with Chicago about when migrants are coming and where they're being dropped off. They're just dropping all people anywhere. Do you understand how, how raggedy and how evil that is? Since May, nearly 500 buses have arrived in Chicago with migrants. Martinez's death, yet another flashpoint, as the Biden administration draws criticism from some big city mayors over the federal government's response. What would the White House say to his family? That's devastating. A child dying, anyone uh, dying, uh, is devastating. And I know that the president feels the same way. This is why we have taken this very seriously from day one when it comes to dealing with a broken immigration system. In New York, the number of migrants is now up to more than 150,000. And now many of those families living in the city's emergency shelter system are being told they need to clear out just after Christmas. Yo le dije a mi hijo que, que aproveche. Aprovechen, disfruten el, el hotel que estamos un, con un techo ahorita porque ya nos van a mandar. Ya nos van a mandar y, y vamos a estar ya en, a dormir en el tren o, o en la calle. Y mi hijo solo se puso a llorar y dijo, tengamos fe. Today, some advocates protesting at City Hall, demanding that migrants be allowed to stay in shelters through the winter. Listen, I, I've been on protests. <laughs> you know, when they finish protesting, they should start volunteering. 
We have a lot of needs. If they say don't do the 60-day rule, give me an alternative. Because we've been open to ideas. And Gabe joins us now from the White House as the Biden administration takes an increasingly active role in these border funding negotiations. Gabe, is President Biden regretting linking border security and Ukraine aid at this point? I mean, none of it is getting through Congress, right? Yeah, you know, Ellison, I asked the White House that question. Not at all, Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre said, adding that this is emergency funding all around. But critics of the administration wonder if it was the best strategy, given the complexity of any potential policy changes at the border, Ellison. And Gabe, we also just heard from the city of Chicago about the shelter that five-year-old boy was staying in. Is that right? Uh, yeah, that's right, Allison. The city of Chicago says that the child's death was not related to the th three other people taken to the hospital. The Chicago Department of Public Health also says the child does not appear to have died from an infectious disease, and there is no evidence of an outbreak at the shelter. Allison. Gabe Gutierrez at the White House. Thank you. We turn now to the weather and parts of the Northeast still under flood alerts after yesterday's deadly storm on the East Coast. River levels threatening to rise with the race to clean up well underway. Crews now trying to restore power to hundreds of thousands of homes and businesses. NBC News correspondent Emily Ikeda has the latest from the flood zone. Tonight, first responders fanning out across a battered northeast as lingering floodwaters from Monday's monstrous storm continue stranding families. Obviously, with the water starting to crest now, it's going to uh, only get worse before it gets better. With parts of Maine and New Jersey under states of emergency. Michelle called for help when water rose around her home with her sister still inside. What's going through your mind? Uh, it's traumatic. Uh, the water's disgusting. And I just, I, I want her safe. We followed the water rescue team to the family store step. And get through the flood water as quick as possible with minimal uh, time within the water. The 14 year old climbing to safety before she was met by a warm embrace back on dry ground. It's a stark contrast. A sunny day paired with flooded roadways. Even without rain, parts of the Passaic River could remain in flood stage through at least Friday. Floodwaters blocking fire trucks from reaching this burning home today. Across the Northeast, at least five people died from falling trees and flooding, including a 76 year old woman who was swept away in New York. Vehicles completely submerged at this time. Tonight, several hundred thousand are still without power in New England. And it could be a couple days of cold temperatures before it's completely restored. You get three quarters of the way down a street, you got to turn around, go the other way. Why is hanging? With a massive cleanup ahead and early start to holiday travel, snarled by blocked off and even collapsed roads. At airports today, travelers relieved to find fewer flight cancellations. During Christmas time, yeah, it's nerve wracking coming with everybody. You just got to be on your toes and make sure you're there early. But a record week of air travel could turn turbulent later this week when a deluge of rain is set to hit the West Coast. Emily Aketa joins us now from Patterson, New Jersey. Emily, there's still concern that water could keep rising well into tonight. Ellison, that's right. Keep in mind, major rivers like the Passaic River, not far from where I'm standing, those levels are continuing to rise, which means flood waters in neighborhoods like this could continue to worsen, just as some residents have yet to even begin assessing the damage to their homes just days out from the Christmas holiday, Ellison. And Emily, we know flight disruptions improved a bit today, but what can people expect for the rest of the week? Well, it's certainly something so many people will be watching closely as this week is expected to be one of, if not the busiest weeks for air travel around the Christmas holiday. Now, the severe weather has moved out of the northeast region, and they're actually expecting unseasonably warm temperatures for this weekend. But the West Coast is bracing for back-to-back -back storms, a deluge of rain that could snarl travel. Ellison. Emily Aketa, thank you. And for more on that wet winter weather, NBC News meteorologist Bill Karens joins me now. Bill, Emily mentioned the conditions worsening on the West Coast. What's the latest? We kind of are in the, you know, we're waiting. We're waiting for this big storm that's spinning off the coast to make its move. It's a slow moving storm system and it's going to take its sweet time. And then finally, by the time we get to Thursday and Friday is when it'll be moving towards the coastal areas. As far as the flooding potential goes, the greatest risk is going to be from the border with Mexico, from San Diego, northwards Oceanside, Los Angeles to Santa Barbara. 21 million people are included in flash flood wa watches. And this goes all the way out until Friday. So we got a long duration 
duration event here. So let's play it out. This is going to be Wednesday. There's some rain hit and miss in Los Angeles. Not really the big stuff. When you start to see the bright red and yellows, that's when our biggest flash flood threat will occur. And that moves in as we go throughout late Thursday night into Friday morning. So for that reason, that is the greatest risk of flash flooding. And especially any of those fires in the past, we get the, the burn scars, we get the debris flows and the mudslides. That's the concern. And someone could down here could easily get more than four inches of rain in the mountains outside of Los Angeles. They haven't had a big storm yet this rainy season for them, which is the winter time. Uh, this will be the first one. So we'll think, fingers crossed we don't get too much damage out of this. So here's how the holiday outlook looks on Friday. Rain from Chicago down to Dallas. That big storm will be heading into Arizona. Saturday, East Coast, fine. Great Lakes, fine. But the Southern Plains, all the way through areas of the Four Corner region is where it's stormy. And as far as a white Christmas goes, you may just get your wish in portions of Colorado, Wyoming, uh, Western Nebraska, up through the Dakotas. And then finally, as we go through Christmas Day, we're dry in the Northeast, but unfortunately, we're dashing through the rain from New Orleans all the way through the Tennessee Valley into the Ohio Valley. So not a lot of snow out there, Ellison, but uh, there will be some windshield wipers. All right, dashing through the rain, we will manage. Bill Karens, yeah. thank you. We appreciate it. Next tonight, we head to Iceland and the potentially dangerous eruption of a, of a volcano there that is threatening communities not far from the capital. NBC News correspondent Miguel Almaguer has this story. The incredible fountains of fire gushed more than 300 feet into the air, igniting the night sky in Iceland. Erupting Monday, the astonishing display of fire and fury continues to pour across the southwestern end of the country, an hour outside the capital of Reykjavik. It's a once in a lifetime for us. A 2.5 mile long fissure is now creating an expansive boiling sea of molten lava, threatening to slowly spread closer to populated regions. But for now, the blanket of fire not yet causing serious damage. Fascinating to see just nature in action. I just, it's just like something from a movie. As researchers descend closer to the spouts of fire, this is a magical spectacle, even in a country no stranger to eruptions. After weeks of seismic activity, nearby towns were evacuated days before lava even seeped from the Earth's floor. The flows now slowing. It is very, very powerful in the beginning. It's going to extract the magma very, very fast, and that's why it's going to decline fairly fast. Still pouring smoke into the air, it doesn't appear this eruption will cause the same havoc a different Icelandic volcano did in 2010. That explosion of fumes and ash grounded much of Europe's air travel for a week. But tonight, scientists warn eruptions can be as unpredictable as they are spectacular. Miguel Almaguer, NBC News. Staying overseas, we head now to the war in the Middle East. Major shipping companies now halting service through the Red Sea after Iranian-backed militia attacked multiple commercial ships. The growing conflict coming as hopes for another ceasefire agreement and the return of hostages remains up in the air. NBC's chief foreign correspondent Richard Engel has the latest. The cargo giant Maersk joined BP in halting traffic through the Red Sea in response to attacks by the Iranian-backed Yemeni militia known as the Houthis, who have hijacked and fired on several ships. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin in Bahrain today, home of the U.S. Fifth Fleet, announced the formation of a 10-nation coalition to defend the Red Sea. But the Houthis vow to keep attacking ships until Israel ends its blockade of Gaza. The showdown sending oil prices up again today. While the Palestinian Islamic Jihad tonight put out a video of two Israeli men it's holding hostage, yesterday Hamas released a video of three elderly hostages taken under duress. The man on the right is 83-year-old Yoram Metzger. His son Guy told us he takes comfort in knowing his father is alive but worries about his treatment by Hamas. He looks very, very tired. He looks very sick. Also his friends. We are really, really worried about, about uh, their condition. He says the Israeli government should do more to get a deal to free the hostages. You don't have confidence in Prime Minister Netanyahu's efforts? Do you think I, I should have confidence in President Netanyahu after what's happened in the 7th of October? The Gaza Strip is at a breaking point. As Israel attacks Hamas, aid groups say 2.3 million Palestinians 
are paying an unbearable price. <laughs> Mahmoud Zagrub was in a hospital today in Rafah, injured by an Israeli strike, when doctors brought him the bodies of his son and two-week-old daughter Aisha. The World Health Organization today described the situation in Gaza's hospitals as beyond belief and unconscionable. And Richard Engel joins us now from Tel Aviv. Richard, are there any updates in terms of the ceasefire negotiations? Well, they are progressing, and Qatar is reporting progress, and there are multiple reports that they will continue tomorrow in Egypt. So we don't know the specific details. There's a lot of reporting out there of what may be on the table, what is not on the table, uh, but this is the most progress that we've seen so far. So uh, the, the fact that they are progressing, that they could be continuing tomorrow in Egypt, uh, that calls are being made, uh, that there is uh, some talk of uh, about now the number number of hostages that may be released, the timeline uh, that could be extended. Uh, all of this is, is indication that the two sides are starting to get down to the, to the heart of the matter and, and putting real proposals on the table, which was not the case even just a few days ago. Hmm. Richard Engel in Tel Aviv, thank you. Still ahead tonight, the Senate sex scandal. A staffer for Senator Ben Cardin fired after he was accused of having sex inside a Senate hearing room on video. How Senator Cardin is responding. Plus, the SUV flipping over while doing donuts, landing on the teenage passengers who were hanging out of the window. The charges that driver is now facing. And Americans looking to buy Apple Series 9 and Ultra watches will have to wait a while. Why the company is halting sales of the products in the U.S. Stay with us. Top Story is just getting started. We're back now with the shocking allegations against a former Senate staffer, a legislative aide to Maryland Senator Ben Cardin, accused of having sex on video in a Senate hearing room. The reaction from that staffer's former boss and the possible charges he could be facing. NBC News correspondent Sahil Kapoor is on Capitol Hill tonight with the latest. Tonight, the sex scandal rocking the U.S. Senate. A legislative aide to Maryland Senator Ben Cardin out of a job after a video first published by conservative outlet The Daily Caller alleged to show him having sex in a Senate hearing room used for Supreme Court confirmations and high-profile hearings. I was angry, uh, disappointed. Uh, it's a breach of trust. Senator Cardin confirming to NBC News that staffer Aidan Maisie Sarofsky is no longer a Senate employee, but refusing to discuss details of the case or say if he was fired. Capitol Police are now investigating the incident for possible criminal activity. The only issue that could potentially be at play would involve the location. If a court would decide this hearing room to be a public place, well, there are also laws there that prevent this type of behavior in a public forum. Maisie Sarofsky responding to the allegations in a statement on his LinkedIn account, which has since been deleted, saying, I have been attacked for who I love to pursue a political agenda. While some of my actions in the past have shown poor judgment, I love my job and would never disrespect my workplace. He did not respond to a request for additional comment. There does not appear to be any precedent happening federally in the Senate or Congress or the Capitol. These would only be misdemeanors. So that means jail time maximum of a few months, but unlikely if he doesn't have a criminal past and likely just a fine. The video, reportedly published in a private online group for gay men, has not been independently verified by NBC News. But Republicans now seizing on the incident, Georgia Congressman Mike Collins posting this image comparing the video to the desecration of the U.S. Capitol on January 6th, 2021. Sahil Kapoor joins us now from Capitol Hill. So Sahil, we know you were at that press gaggle earlier where Senator Ben Cardin made the comments we just heard in your piece. What else did he say about this incident? That's right, Ellison. The senator called it a tragic situation. He said he has not spoken to the now former staffer. He said he's unaware of any disciplinary priors uh, he may have had. He also declined to confirm or discuss the details of this incident, said only that it's a personal issue, that it's under investigation, and that his main concern is how other staffers, uh, Senate staffers, feel about it. Now, this is a bizarre way to end what has been a bizarre year in Congress, one of the most uh, legislatively unproductive 
productive years we've seen in modern times, but it's been packed with all these oddball dramas in the House and the Senate from two lengthy speaker fights uh, to overthrowing a Speaker of the House mid-session for the first time uh, in history. Uh, there has been a, you know, multiple fights over preventing government shutdowns and preventing debt default. A senator once literally tried to fight a committee uh, a witness at a committee hearing, and then there was the expulsion recently of serial fabricator George Santos. And now, to cap it all off, this bizarre story. Allison. An eventful year, to say the least. Sahil Kapoor, thank you. Coming up, the Super Bowl champ arrested. Former NFL running back Derek Ward arrested for a string of robberies in Los Angeles. What we're learning about those alleged crimes. We're back now with Top Stories News Feed, and we begin with the arrest of former NFL running back and Super Bowl champion Derek Ward. Los Angeles police say Ward is accused of robbing multiple businesses, including gas stations, over a period of several days. Law enforcement claiming no guns were used in the robberies, but that Ward did use force to intimidate workers and get money from stores. An SUV toppling over and crushing five people in Colorado. New cell phone video shared on social media shows the vehicle attempting donuts in a strip mall parking lot, then rolling over onto passengers who were hanging out of the window. Police say the 19-year-old driver is facing up to three counts of vehicular assault. Five people who are all minors were hospitalized, but they are expected to survive. And Apple will be halting sales of their seri Series 9 and Ultra 2 Apple Watches in the U.S. The International Trade Commission ordering the tech giant to stop importing the watches following a patent dispute over their blood oxygen monitor technology. Medical tech company Massimo saying the monitor was illegally incorporated, but Apple says they strongly disagree with the order. The Presidential Review Panel is now assessing the ITC's ruling. Turning now to China and the aftermath of an earthquake that killed over 100 people and destroyed thousands of buildings. NBC's Janice Mackey Freyer is in China with the late details. Tonight, the powerful tremors set off a scramble in northwestern China. People running from homes and buildings into the frigid night. At the earthquake's epicenter, an all-out search for survivors. Videos and photos shared by Chinese state media showing people pulled from the rubble. At least 127 are dead and scores are injured. <laughs> Local officials say nearly 5,000 buildings were destroyed. Freezing temperatures at high altitude, making rescue operations more of a challenge. China's earthquake agency said the trembler measured magnitude 6.2 at a depth of just six miles, centered in Jushishan, a remote and impoverished county along the Tibetan Plateau, an area where earthquakes are not uncommon, but this is the deadliest in nearly a decade. More than 300 aftershocks have followed, according to state media, thousands now huddling in temporary shelters and bitter conditions. With a cold wave gripping much of northern China, rescue officials say the next 48 hours are crucial, a race against time and temperatures to find survivors. Allison. Janice Mackey Freyer, thank you. Now to Top Stories Global Watch and a massive fire ripping through a hotel in South Korea. Dramatic video shows flames engulfing the 18-story building about 17 miles outside of Seoul. Luckily, no one was killed, but more than 50 people were hurt. The cause of the blaze is still under investigation. A fuel crisis unfolding in Guyana following a deadly explosion earlier this week. New video shows long lines outside of gas stations in the capital city as the country grapples with a devastating explosion at an oil plant. The explosion left at least 14 people dead and hundreds injured. It also destroyed critical fuel tanks. The country now facing a fuel shortage and rising gas prices. And shocking footage uh, showing an airplane blowing away as an extreme storm battered eastern Argentina. The plane was parked on a runway when wind gusts of up to 100 miles per hour began battering the Buenos Aires region. The aircraft can be seen spinning before smashing into a flight of boarding stairs. The plane was damaged and the crash caused several scheduled flights to be canceled. Amazingly, no one was hurt. 
Coming up, Ukraine in need. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky admitting Ukraine's military is facing challenges as it prepares to enter its third year in a war against Russia. The urgent warning from the Biden administration as aid for Ukraine runs out. Back now on Top Story, we turn to Europe, where fighting between Russia and Ukraine prepares to enter its third year. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky revealing the army needs nearly 500,000 people to mobilize for fighting before U.S. aid runs out. This as Russia promises to not give up what they say is theirs. The war in Ukraine is far from over. But one of the most significant streams of aid could be coming to an end. Tonight, a dire warning from the White House. Money to support the war in Ukraine is out. We had one more security assistance package available to us before the end of this year, before we run out of replenishment authority to replenish the stocks and the inventories. And unless Congress approves additional aid before the end of the year, the United States will not be able to send Ukraine support it so desperately needs. The U.S. has already allocated more than $100 billion to Ukraine, military and humanitarian aid, since Russia launched its full-scale invasion in early 2022. We can't let Putin win. But President Biden wants Congress to approve another $60 billion. Republicans are skeptical and say they won't approve more funding without changes to the U.S.'s border and immigration policies. Ukraine is desperate. A top general told Reuters they've already had to scale back some military operations. At a two-hour press conference today, President Volodymyr Zelensky flatly denied suggestions that Ukraine is losing this war, but acknowledged the challenges of fighting a nation with significantly more resources, from weapons to troop levels. So, and I'm confident that the United States will not let us down. And... Uh, what we have agreed in United States will be fulfilled in full. Last week, Ukraine's former defense minister, Andriy Zahorinuk, told NBC News it's disappointing that internal politics in the U.S. are impacting Ukraine. And we understand uh, that there is a political process and so on. It's just, uh, it's just like they need to remember that every day or months of delayed assistance, uh, that's somebody's life on stake. The, the fact that some politicians don't realize that, uh, that's uh, quite concerning, I have to say. Meanwhile, Russia is carrying on. <inaudible> President Vladimir Putin claims he is willing to negotiate and talk about Ukraine, but accused the U.S. of, quote, dragging Russia and Europe into this conflict on purpose. For more on the state of the war in Ukraine and Putin's next move, let's bring in the director of the USC School of International Relations, Robert English. Robert, you have written in the past that Russia is facing an economic war of attrition with the West. You wrote that, I believe, at the start of Russia's full-scale invasion in February of 2022. At a meeting today with Russia's defense ministry, we heard President Putin say the economies of countries in Europe are now facing the financial burden of the war. I'm curious what you made of his remarks when we hear Putin say something like that. Is it true? Has the economic situation for Russia changed or is he just posturing a bit? No, he's got a lot of facts on his side. Right. Economic growth is actually about twice as rapid in Russia as it is in the European Union. Unemployment is twice as high in Europe as it is in Russia. So there is some foundation. But we also know that while this is a fast moving economy, it's also very fragile. And this pace cannot be maintained. It's an artificial wartime kind of prosperity with investment in every other sector being neglected. And even Putin's own economists are warning him that this can't be kept up another year, another year and a half, and things will start to crumble. So it's very temporary, but for the moment, he's crowing about his immediate strengths. You know, in some ways, it does feel like we're at a possible tipping point or new phase of what this war looks like moving forward. And there have been such questions uh, for Ukrainians, for Russians, about whether or not this becomes a quote unquote frozen conflict. I'm curious what you see right now. And when you look at the U.S. and the disagreements over funding aid for Ukraine, whether or not you see some sort of dramatic change in the next three to four months, and if that aid isn't 
wasn't approved before Congress leaves for the holidays here in the U.S., does that mean Putin is going in to the new year with a significant win? He's going into the new year strong in either case, but I'm pretty confident. For example, in Europe, the European Union, frustrated at its inability to get past Hungar Hungarian opposition, is finding ways to deliver roughly 50 billion in aid for the next year to Euro Ukraine in any case. And the United States will as well. We're pretty confident that some compromise will be struck. But those new funds and those um, you know, new weapons will still barely be enough to hold the line. Um, very few military strategists now hold out hope for a sweeping Ukrainian victory, liberation of most of the occupied territory. So you're right, we are looking at a different kind of war, one where Ukraine is now giving up on the grand offensive and building defenses and holding the line. And um, sadly, that means the prospect is when a truce is called when peace talks begin, Ukraine will probably end up having to concede a significant chunk of territory. There's no way getting around that. I want to talk to you about the other big headline coming out of this area, and that is Alexei Navalny, Russia's most prominent dissident or opposition leader. He's been imprisoned and was serving a 19-year sentence. He has not been heard from in two weeks now. His own legal team says they have not been able to get in touch with him. Do we have any idea of where he is right now and what could have happened to him? As the time ticks by, there are a lot of people speculating, worried that maybe the worst has happened here. The worst would be that he's very ill or even dead, mm -hmm. and that would be you know, absolutely possible. He has been malnourished. He has been denied medical treatment. We know he's had serious ailments. Digestive ailments has lost a lot of weight. And given the precedence of other dissidents being mistreated or beaten or starved and dying in jail, it's absolutely possible. It's also possible that he's being shuttled around and hushed up because Putin is extraordinarily sensitive about his public image and a picture of unity in all of Russia going into this election he's staging in March. He doesn't want dissidents. He doesn't want acts of protest. He doesn't want Navalny's supporters, who are very well organized and continuously manage um, sort of social media stunts and, and open protests of one sort or another. He doesn't want that. And so he's probably trying to cut Navalny off from contact with the outside world, preventing his own lawyers from transmitting messages. And so keeping him kind of incommunicado, shuttling between prisons. Uh, let's hope it's only that and not a death sentence. Robert English, director of the USC School of International Relations. Thank you, we appreciate your time and insight. And make sure to tune in for the new documentary, Putin Swore. Our Keir Simmons takes an in-depth look at Vladimir Putin and his powerful network. That premieres tonight at 9 p.m. Eastern on NBC News Now. It will also be streaming on Peacock. When we come back, a special reunion for a special sheep. You heard that, right? A sheep named Fiona rescued earlier this year after she was stranded at the bottom of a Scottish cliff for two years, the moment she met the kayaker who first spotted and helped save her. That is next. And finally tonight, the full circle moment for Britain's so-called loneliest sheep. The woolly farm animal Fiona spent over two years stranded at the bottom of a Scottish cliff. Earlier this year, local farmers undertaking a daring rescue operation. And now the kayaker who first spotted Fiona getting the chance to reunite with the now famous fleece. It was a call just like this that brought Fiona the sheep into the spotlight. This sheep is special. There is no way, no, there's no other way to describe it. For over two years, Fiona the sheep looked like this, scruffy and overgrown, stranded at the bottom of a steep Scottish cliff. Kayaker Jill Turner snapping these pictures that captured the public's imagination. And of course she ran along the shore because a very rocky shore, but if, you know, there are some flat areas she could jump across and she followed us right to the edge Newspapers dubbing Fiona Britain's loneliest sheep. Not long after, a group of Scottish farmers organized a daring rescue. She's happy enough, isn't she? You're all right. Fiona winched up hundreds of feet to safety. Well, being terrified of heights and of dying, I was very, very relieved, I must admit. Uh, but even more relieved that we got her up there without her, you know, having any issues. Her overgrown coat sheared off. 
Fiona now settling into her new life at the Dalscone Fun Farm. We're going to start socialising with her, uh, get her. Hopefully she'll start eating out of her hand and um, she'll start just getting used to people as well. Hello everyone, it is Farmer Ben speaking and welcome to another Facebook Live from Dalscone. Farmer Bin live streaming updates to eager Fiona fans on Facebook, recently sharing this full circle moment. I have some big news regarding Fiona and I'll put some pictures up later on about this as well. We had the lovely Jill Turner come and see us who actually found Fiona. She is the kayaker who found Fiona in the first place all those weeks ago. Britain's loneliest sheep now living a life full of friendship. It was lovely for her and it was quite a heartfelt moment to actually see her, meet her in person, face to face and up close and get to feed her and see how well Fiona is doing. So that was lovely. That was absolutely lovely. Thank you so much for watching Top Story. For Tom Yamas, I'm Ellison Barber in New York. Stay right there. More news now is on the way. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.